you very much. This one? That's good. I've also got one more advert, which is I recently bought this publication, Business New Europe, which you may be familiar with. So I hope you're all uh, subscribers to the premier uh, business analysis in emerging markets. Um, and uh, it's very much part of my uh, career that I'm, I'm interested in, in emerging markets. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why uh, I got involved in the journalism side is because I was fed up with reading ethnocentric rubbish. Um, when I worked in Washington, I had an Uruguayan friend, oh, I still have an Uruguayan friend, he's a very good friend of mine, and he caught me reading um, a certain magazine uh, published in the UK, um, uh, which is a weekly, highly popular publication, which won't be named, and he said, what are you doing reading that? Uh, do yourself a favour, read the, um, the title of, an, of each article, cover the, the text, write down what you think they're going to say, and then test yourself, and if you get over 90% right, then you're wasting your time on you. And I did that, and he was absolutely right. Um, and we're very poorly served, I think, um, uh, in the emerging markets. Um, I'm going to start talking a little bit, first of all, about... Um, uh, where's my speech? It's here, actually. It's on a piece of paper here. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to start with is, is really... I was, I was asked uh, just before the dinner whether the Czech Republic was, in my view, an emerging market. It's a very loaded question. But I immediately answered yes. And, and that's because of my definition of what an emerging market is. Um, for me, all countries are risky. Um, the phrase, by the way, risk-free, is an abuse of the English language. There is no such thing. Um, all countries are risky. Emerging markets are the ones where that risk is perceived, where it's priced in. And if we get to a position where the usefulness of the phrase emerging markets disappears, it'll be because we finally start pricing in the risks in developed countries. But we're a long way from that. Thomas Kuhn uh, was famous for the, the phrase, much abused, overused paradigm shift. Uh, in his famous book, uh, The Theory of uh, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions, he talked about um, physicists. He talked about how um, people who believed in uh, Newtonian theory uh, would persist in believing in Newton, uh, even though it does not adequately explain the trajectory of Mercury because uh, uh, of the, the, the forces of gravity distort space-time. And there was a perfectly good theory, uh, Einstein's theory, which does do that. It actually takes, uh, you actually have to wait, although there's this paradigm shift, you have to wait until all the old scientists die to get consensus. Um, prejudices are very close to our hearts. Prejudices are the parts of our world we don't think about. They are the ticks in the box. Thinking is hard work. We don't like doing thinking, if we can help it. And there's far too many things to think about. So if there's areas where we don't have to think about, then we don't. And our world is nothing like as testable as physics. We live in a world in finance, in economics, in asset allocation, where, frankly, people believe what they want to believe, and they go on believing what they want to believe until they die. And one of the things they like to believe in is that emerging markets are terribly risky, and you shouldn't invest in emerging markets. Hence, probably, the questioner uh, who wanted to know that I've agreed with him that, we, that Czech was no longer an emerging market, maybe. I don't know. But um, this presents a huge arbitrage. It also presents massive opportunities. Um, we have, I think, one of the things that's really interested me over my career, and I should say what Ashmore did, what, what, I, what we did at Ashmore was we managed about $80 billion in emerging markets. Um, and I've been described as the evangelist of emerging market debt. And that's one of the reasons for that is because we were the first company to really persuade US institutional investors, public pension funds, to invest in emerging market debt as an asset class. Um, and uh, there was no competition at the time. But... You know, emerging markets um, uh, is, is about prejudice. And one of the most interesting things is how people's views of the world, which can be very different, can suddenly change. Uh, my second son has uh, followed me and, and has got two uh, degrees in economics. And during one of them, uh, he sent me a, 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 an article and asked me a question. He said, uh, Dad, you know, can you explain this? Because it says here this... This economist is writing that nobody foresaw the Thai crisis in 1997. Is that right? And I was thinking, of course it's not right. I remember perfectly well telling people to get out 
Uh, and that's not because I can do anything more than read, by the way. Um, it takes no genius. Um, you had very, very clear uh, warning signals from, from the IMF. And if that's not good enough, uh, George Soros very publicly had a massive speculative attack on the Thai Bart six months before it finally fell. And, was, and that was only averted uh, because the Malaysian central banks and others uh, bailed the ties out. So what would an economist, what was an economist doing years later uh, saying that nobody foresaw this crisis? And of course, the reality was that some people didn't foresee it. Not that the market didn't. The market was not homogenous. There were people who had one view of the world, people who actually understood what a balance of payments crisis looks like. Um, Greece. <clears throat> um, and those that thought that what they saw was an arbitrage, um, where basically they were being offered a few more basis points, they'd better put some more money in. What was really interesting that over time, what you have is that the concentration of uh, the investor base increases. And that, for me, is one of the three signals, which is uh, uh, observable, particularly from a regulatory point of view. You can observe the, the concentration of your investor bases. And that is one of the three warning signals uh, for a potential systemic crisis, in my view. What are the other two? Well, the second one is a misunderstanding of risk that may shortly change. So calling something risk-free for a start, that's a misunderstanding of risk. Um, and if it's about to change, then you've got a serious problem. And the third, of course, is leverage. Leverage, uh, not necessarily in the instrument, but leverage somewhere which affects the behavior of the investor base. So we do have some serious problems. I remember when we were managing uh, money at Ashmore um, just after uh, 07 uh, and 08, and sometimes our weekly investment committee would last another two hours. Um, but the interesting thing was what we were doing in that extra two hours was no more or less than going through the portfolio and looking at individual assets and thinking, working out, to the best of our knowledge, who owned those assets in the market and what might their behavior be in certain future scenarios that we were worried about. And then, in a very granular way, adding up the uh, likely behavior pattern and making sure that in any scenario we had a response to enable us to manage the portfolio which we were highly successful in doing. But this is a granularity. This isn't some sort of perfect market model. This is actually working out who owns what. Keynes called liquidity a fetish. Um, and he made the simple point that you, know, you need supply and demand for a market to work. If everybody wants to sell at the same time, it's not much good that there's been massive liquidity in the past. So here's a frightening thought. Um, if you look at tick data in the US, uh, for the last 15 years, the major reason for holding up via the US Treasury market, the US dollar, is emerging market central bank purchases of US Treasuries. And they are overwhelmingly dominant now in the investor base for US Treasuries outside the US. Yes, of course, central banks, the Fed has enormous uh, portfolio, but that's irrelevant when you think about the dollar risk. Because, of course, the U.S. has no uh, effective ability to intervene in foreign exchange markets because it doesn't have any foreign exchange reserves. I've been told that whenever I give a speech, I've got to tell you this story. I, I wrote this in 2011, and it was really a little piece I wrote about the five stages of grief. You may have heard of the five stages of grief. I'm only going to talk about the first one, which is denial. So, we have a dead body. I'm going to start with my country. In the UK, we have a dead body. It's called our debt to GDP, over 500%, by the way, if anybody's interested. Uh, not as bad as the US, 640 something, if you count unfunded liabilities. Um, but above the, uh, what I call the heavily indebted developed country average of about 270%. By the way, that compares to emerging markets, 25%. We've got to really worry about those emerging markets, a bit too high. Anyway, so we've got our dead body on the kitchen floor and 500% debt to GDP, and we're arguing about how to deal with it. We've come with some initial thoughts about austerity versus less austerity. Um, there's still an argument of that. We've also come up with the obvious genius idea of having a housing bubble, because, of course, that helps us to uh, create some aggregate demand without affecting the exchange rate. Uh, useful tool to have. 
Uh, but we're at least we're, we're sort of doing something about it. In continental Europe, of course, there's also a, a dead body. It's not in the nice German part of the kitchen floor, which is spotless. It's around the edges. And uh, there's a big argument going on. You know, Germany has got all the cleaning equipment, so why don't they use it? Because we can't have another dead body. We have to give the right incentives. We have to have the incentives that you don't go and create some more dead bodies. So there's this great big argument going on. And in fact, there are certain countries, slightly to the west of Germany, that wouldn't mind just sort of printing money and just, you know, that's, they don't really want strong institutions. They don't want rules. So there's massive argument. We can't agree. The euro is an absolute disaster, complete catastrophe. And the institutions in Europe are not functioning. They are not coping. So what we're going to do instead is we've decided our consensus view is to get a nice big sheet and cover the body and see if we can just sort of forget about it for a bit. Unfortunately, the blood keeps on oozing out. So we need a, a bigger sheet and then a bigger one but the blood is still coming out the bottom. It's getting in the shoe leather. It's getting all sorts of sticky as, as it... Oh, no, you probably don't know about that. And um, that's, what we're, that's what we're doing. We just are completely in denial. In the United States, they've taken the dead body, they've put it in a chair, they've given it a cup of coffee, and they're trying to have a conversation with it. <laughs> but the United States is the United States. They can do no wrong. Theirs is the dollar. Everything... Everything is referenced to the dollar. What is this fixation with the dollar? There's this psychological need, again, to have a sense of fixity in life. You know, we need our, our, our points of reference, and the dollar is one of them. So again, say I'm standing on a hilltop, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm observing this bird, an emergent, I'm going to call it, a bit like a cormorant maybe, I don't know. But it's an emergent bird, and it's, uh, it, it's flying in the, in the air like this. It's moving around a bit. That's due to poor navigational skills, probably. Um, and I'm sure it's the fiscal authorities, not the monetary authorities in present company. But it's, it's, it's poor navigation, and maybe a bit of a air turbulence, of course. Um, anyway, I'm sort of observing it. I'm calling this angle the spread, by the way, the sort of angle of, of view. And then I look at some other birds, and I see them moving around at different paces as well. And suddenly, I notice that the volatility has increased. And all these birds are going like this. And it's highly correlated. Goodness me, these birds are highly risky. Very correlated. And then I have a revelation. I'm not standing on a hill. I'm standing on the deck of a ship. I was becalmed, and now I'm in a storm. Fundamental change of view. Fundamental uh, uh, change of worldview. Same sort of story with uh, Thailand. Same sort of story with Greece, actually. I, a colleague of mine from Ashmore uh, was invited to the big table. Uh, come and have a discussion about Greece. This must have been, this was quite early on, maybe 09 or something. And they went around the table asking, you know, European uh, bond investors, the grown-ups, when what was going to happen to the Greek bond? And the arguments broadly went along the lines, well, the bond can't really go more than two standard deviations, the spread, that is, uh, over, over the Bund. And, you know, bearing in mind, you know, thinking about the normal distribution, or maybe even something slightly different, that means it really can't get lower than 85 cents on the dollar. And there was all this consensus. And then they got to the emerging market guys at the end. And they said, well, we've got a very different view of the world. And what we've got here is a, you know, balanced payments problem. Classic IMF stuff. We've seen hundreds of these. When you have a country with an unsustainable debt to, debt to GDP... Oh, by the way, what is an unsustainable debt to GDP? It's a bit, it's a bit like a central bank reserve requirement. It's a bit, uh, you know, it's, it's, make, it's, it's whatever the market thinks credible. And I can tell you, it's very different for Greece than it is for a lot of other countries. And it can be very different for the same country at different points of time. So realistically in Greece, it's 60%. Now, if the IMF had said 60%, given the fact that Italy next door is already at 120%, probably wouldn't have done very well, gone down very well in Italy. So, say it's 120%. It never was. It was always 60. But even if it's 120, there's no way that using standard fiscal austerity, you can get from where you are to that number in Greece. No chance whatsoever. Then you have two, and only two, policy choices. Very simple. 
some form of debt restructuring uh, or, or, or default, and of course, some sort of devaluation, making sure that the debt is in the devalued currency. That's it. End of story. Standard IMF prescription. So if you think that leaving the euro at this point of time, this is 09, remember, is completely impossible, then it's a back of the envelope, very simple uh, you know, set of numbers. You can do it in a few seconds, and the haircut is 85% if you're being prudent. Very, very different. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, all the jaws around the breakfast table are dropping. And it's not because they disagree, it's because they've been forced to think about the problem in a different way. The moment they're forced to think about it in a different way, they get it. The moment you buy into Einstein's theory, you never go back to Newton. That's not the way these things work. So these are the interesting, if you like, uh, changes in people's thoughts. And the way that investment behavior uh, is often driven is through these sort of uh, revelatory Experiences, And that's why, in my view, central banks and regulators should be not only monitoring much more carefully who owns what, but actually mapping not just that, but their belief systems and trying to work out. And it's not that difficult. You do some surveys, you go and talk to people. Some central banks do this quite well already, and actually I would include the Bank of England. Um, others, of course, other regulatory bodies find this impossible because they don't have any centralised a uh, regulator for a start, like the United States. Um, and they just are not prepared for whatever reason to collect the necessary data. We also have massive prejudice. I wrote my book, it took me years, it took me nine drafts. Uh, I had people tell me it was more than one book. Um, and I was determined to get it all in one book and to get it in a readable length. So there's no, rep no repetition, so you have to pay attention, I'm afraid. Um, but it, I wanted to put lots of different things in because it is all about prejudice. If I write about one aspect of the problem, then I know there's a certain group of readers that will read that and think, oh, yes, but they'll discount that and think of some other reason. So I was most flattered when an ex-finance minister uh, told me, and I, he contacted me after the blue, after I hadn't seen him since for about 20 years, and said it was the best book on on economics he'd read since the 1970s, so I was very flattered. So there's a bit of economics, an analysis of what the problem is today. But fundamentally, it's, a, it's an attack on finance theory. What I'm saying is really following uh, the words of Milton Friedman, when Milton Friedman said, if a theory neither has realistic assumptions nor testable results, then it's worthless. And a lot of finance theory, I have to say, falls into that category. And it's not necessarily the academic's fault, but it is the fault of those who are practitioners who then use it, knowing, as many do, that, of course, it's false. Um, the result is a massive misallocation of capital on a global scale, affecting hundreds of millions of people. Let me start with a little uh, dig at Markowitz who wrote in 1959 a 360-page monogram. And at one point during the monogram, uh, in one sentence, having described that the volatility, the variance of a particular stock, can be explained in terms of what he calls idiosyncratic risk, he means volatility, um, covariances or correlations with other stocks and a correlation to an index. He says, for computational ease, we shall ignore the co covariances. That's it. From that basic error, we today have this misguided idea that we can represent asset classes by indices. That also, uh, you'll probably, maybe some of you have learned in business schools, that uh, if you randomly add stocks to a portfolio, then after about 13 or 15 stocks, you can't get any more diversification uh, than, you can't get lower volatility than the index. But the key word is randomly. If you don't do it randomly, you can. Quite easily, actually, because say you know coal producers are naturally less volatile than uh, you know other stocks, or you've got you know some that are just boring. You can just select those, of course. Kind of obvious to anybody who doesn't have advanced training in these matters. And um, we also have the whole debate about what is an asset class. Um, and behind some of this argument, of course, is uh, some vested interests. 
We have, on the one hand, consultants who will tell pension funds that, of course, they're most important, and asset allocation is absolutely crucial. One of the most misquoted studies in the entire history of finance theory is a very famous by Brinson et al., which basically doesn't say what people think it says, which is that asset allocation is more important than managed selection. But, you know, on the one hand, you've got consultants saying that, and on the other, you've got managers, as I was one, saying, no, management, manager selection is much more important. But I think we need to start understanding these in terms of principal agent problems. The biggest principal agent problem is the fact that people use theory, they know to be false. And they use it anyway because everybody else uses it and there's no easy alternative. And I'm very sorry to say I don't have an easy alternative. I've, I'm, mine is a hatchet job. Um, Keynes's famous book, of course, was also a hatchet job. 80% uh, of the general theory was really a hatchet job on, on Marshall. But then he came up with a wonderful theory, the other 20%. We have two things that uh, we didn't have in the 1930s. One, Keynes invented macroeconomics. The other thing, which I wrote in my blog today, actually, uh, we have the emerging markets as a potentially huge source of global aggregate demand, uh, although we have to uh, uh, direct that investment uh, in ways that are productive and actually reduce bottlenecks, not create more, I avoid inflation. That means investing in infrastructure. What did Keynes say? Keynes, uh, like Frank Knight, the founder of Chicago Economics in 1921, Frank Knight said that made the distinction between risk and uncertainty. He said, if you have random events where you know the probability distribution, that is risk. And risk you can hedge or ensure. Uncertainty, or what he calls one-off events, you don't know the probability distribution. There may not be one, because it's a one-off event. Keynes's general theory, in a sentence, apologies to Keynes, is when you have a lot of uncertainty, entrepreneurs will not employ more people put up new factories, they will wait. And that uncertainty creates more uncertainty for others. And that creates, therefore, less investment. And this, has, this positive feedback effect leads to a slump. That's Keynes. The moment that uh, John Hicks, then Sir John Hicks, created the ISLM framework, and that's as technical as I'm going to get in this talk, but anybody who's done undergraduate economics will remember that's how the way, that's the classic way that Keynes is taught. He was criticized right from the start from taking that uncertainty out. And we've had since then, not just the Chicago school, but the so-called New Keynesians, Robert Lucas, etc., that have tried to be, they've tried to square the circle ever since. You've basically got a completely different logic with macroeconomics to microeconomics. And we've had a, this huge intellectual effort to make the two join up with these so-called microeconomic foundations of macroeconomics. It hasn't mattered until now. It matters now because we do have depression risk. And I say do, I don't mean did just in, 90, in 07. We do now. What do I mean by that? There are two major global structural problems in the global economy, and neither of them have got any healthier. Both of them have got worse since so 07, 08. And both of them are major problems which make most of our traditional happy way of doing asset allocation highly risky. Suddenly, macroeconomics matters absolutely essentially to the way we do asset allocation. We ignore it at our peril. The one, fairly easy to understand, is of course the massive indebtedness I've already referred to in the heavily indebted developed countries. What caused that? Well, two things caused it. Um, uh, one, of course, poor regulation. Um, and, and two, the whole US yield curve being uh, actually reduced. And that was caused by the second big imbalance, which we call global imbalances. After the Asia crisis, um, when, you know, depending on outside insurance, the IMF was seen as suboptimal by a lot of emerging markets, emerging markets decided to self-insure. And to do that, they started building up central bank reserves. A number of exporters of oil also did the same thing at the same time. And you've had this enormous growth in reserves such that today, 80% of global central bank reserves are owned by emerging market central banks. This is a major global imbalance. It's, it's, it's created a completely artificial foreign exchange environment where emerging market currencies are about 30 or 40% undervalued compared to the dollar. Or put it another way, the dollar is massively overvalued. 
And what does history tell us? Well, uh, again, I don't want to get too technical, but there's a thing called the Triffin Dilemma, which is to do with the problem when you have different internal and external priorities for a central bank, which is both central bank for the world and also their own country. We're talking about the United States here. In 1944, at the Bretton Woods Conference, we established the current system, or the system that certainly worked until 1971, whereby currency is pegged to the dollar, and the dollar was convertible to gold at $35 an ounce, the old US Treasury rate. What happened is that, or what happens in, in, in sort of layman's terms, is, is the tension starts to build. If the global economy, say, grows faster than the US, then you need, as a central bank, to inject liquidity to avoid stagnation. But if you're injecting that liquidity only into the US economy, how do you get it from the US economy into the global economy? If you're not careful, you do it by building up of debts. <laughs> and through the 60s, this is basically what happened, even despite the uh, U.S. having trade surpluses, such that by the end of the 60s, the U.S. Uh, um, uh, uh, gold reserves were a, a small fraction of the claims on those gold by holders of dollars. And so the, the London market started attacking the dollar. And there was a thing called the gold pool, which was a collection of central banks from the creditor nations, which in those days was central banks in Western Europe, and they agreed to counter this through intervention. Italians cheated. Other countries cheated now and then. There are all these, you know, political get-togethers and try to fix it. But it was always a bit tense because the U.S. wasn't really doing their work on the fiscal front. They were hardly, you know, behaving themselves by having a war in Vietnam and all the rest of it and spending too much money. And then, the, I suppose, the straw that broke the camel's back was John Connolly, the brash Texan tre Treasury Secretary, who famously said in a conference in Europe, the dollar's our problem, oh, sorry, the dollar's our currency, but your problem. And that was the final straw. And then the Bank of England asked for their gold back, and that was it. Dollar went from $35 an ounce to 100 and and 194 uh, to the ounce by 1974. It, it was moving around all over the time, there was lots of intervention, but that's, the, that's where it peaked at. And other currencies fell apart as well, of course, so it's not so noticeable. Major devaluation, though, and then a decade of inflation to get rid of the imbalances. But we never fixed the international monetary system. I was at a conference a few months ago, actually, in Vienna, around the corner. Uh, and uh, we had some great and good from the international monetary system, ex-managing directors of the IMF, etc. And uh, the, the final panel with all the grey hairs on it, what was interesting was that the consensus was, it was a matter of semantics, whether you say that uh, the international monetary system is, is broken, or you actually say, we haven't got one. Fundamentally, we don't have one. So where are we today? We're now in a world where we have a drug addict that uh, is dependent on importing these savings from the rest of the world. These savings have, created a, uh, have reduced the perception of risk, creating this massive bubble. We have this massive shock to the system, this scare moment, and the end result is, what do we do? We give them more drugs. We just continue. The, the flow from emerging market savers to the US is still con continuing. Emerging market central banks own about $11.5 trillion in so-called liquid sovereign bonds from Europe and the US. And the sovereign wealth funds of these countries another four or $5 trillion. This is orders of magnitude more than any possible flow going the other way. So when people talk about in the press about possible flows out of emerging markets into the developed world, this is complete nonsense. It's ignoring the reality of history that the central banks really call the shots. If I'm a central bank and I've got three, four hundred billion dollars in reserves, that means I can change my exchange rate at will any time I want. That's what it means. If I choose not to bother because I don't really mind a bit of cheaper exchange rate for the moment, and I'm not that worried, and my other peer central banks aren't doing anything, that shouldn't fool the market, but it does fool the market. And history tells us that central banks will panic sell together. They do hurt. That's exactly what happened in 71. And that was when we're talking about a bunch of central banks in Western Europe. They talk to each other. Their trading desks talk to each other every day. And they were coordinated. They were already on a political project for, you know, you know uh, the, the post-Treaty uh, of Rome. So we have this huge potential coordination problem. We have this big global imbalance. And we have this huge indebtedness. Let's think about indebtedness from it. Well, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the, um, 
UK had debt to GDP of about 240%. Took till the end of the century, 80 years, basically to pay that down to a reasonable level. And then it went up again with the First World War. We're not going to do that this time. We're just not going to pay it off. We're going to do what rich countries do uh, in the last 100 years or so, very successfully. We rob savers. That's what we do. And we know from behavioral finance that people don't mind being robbed slowly. That's good. <laughs> Especially if it's other people's money. Pension funds, etc. That's great. So as a policymaker, I think that's fantastic. As a saver, I think it's appalling. And if we can, by the way, bamboozle emerging market central banks into buying some of these gilts and treasuries at the same time, instruments, by the way, which if you're a buy and hold investor, I cannot think of a major or a sort of credible uh, scenario where you get your money back in real terms, right? This isn't an investment. This is a gift, right? It's a consumer choice, maybe, but it's not a sensible investment. Um, so we have something we call financial repression. Financial repression was highly successful after World War II in both Europe and the United States. It's basically defined as any policy which captures domestic savings in order to fund the government and to do so at a lower cost than would otherwise be possible. Quantitative easing, which was originally a means to avoid depression by, avoid, by avoiding bank crash, nothing to do with stimulating the economy directly, by the way. But, oh, but if we said it was about that, then people would realize that if it didn't work, we'd have depression. And that creates the uncertainty that creates the depression. So we better not tell anybody that that was the real purpose of, the, of QE. We better tell them it was, or let them believe that it was partly to stimulate the economy. But we have this sort of policy of QE being a little bit like, you know, uh, uh, Bernanke I see as the chief uh, cheerleader telling everybody that the emperor has wonderful new clothes. Meanwhile, desperately stitching in the back hoping that the economy will, will at some point recover. Well, QE has been very successful. Why? Because barring uh, um, Southern Europe, certainly in the United States and Northern Europe, we have not had depression, and that's a real result. That's very positive. However, we've now got QA, QE having a second function as well, which is to help with financial repression, because, of course, it keeps interest rates very low, and then what you have to do is you have to have inflation slightly higher, and that's how you erode the value of debt over time. That's how QE works. If the bond markets get wise to this, then you have a problem. They start demanding more interest rates. The curve steepens. Uh, if you've got a very high level of debt, people will suddenly think, wow, you're never going to be able to afford that level of debt service, and so bang, you get a bond crash. That's probably not likely until at least uh, the end of next year, by the way. So we're okay for a bit. And the reason for that is that it's the end of next year when the U.S. consumer finally comes back. Um, the U.S. is very much a consumer-led uh, uh, economy. And uh, the consumer has stopped spending because their household indebtedness to income uh, went astronomical. It went way up to 115, even further, uh, percent. Um, and at the current level of deleveraging, it gets to 90%, which is about where it was pre-boom, pre-housing boom. And it's at that level. Is the best guess of economists is that's when you start to get proper consumption-led growth in the United States back again. And that's back end of next year. And that could be worrying, because then if you get real inflation expectations, then, of course, you, you actually do get some major problems. Oh, and by the way, we don't have recovery yet. 46 million people in the United States are on food stamps. 46 million, down from 47 million. Great improvement. Underemployment, still about 15%. So the idea that the US is suddenly you know, recovering or going to be leading the global economy is, is pure nonsense. It's make-believe. And when it does, we've got this other problem. We might get a bond crash. So then what happens? Financial repression won't work, and then you have the other tried and tested way to rob savers. It's called a period of high inflation, which is what we had in the 70s. And what I think a lot of people don't understand is the flip, the going from deflation to inflation might happen very fast. Well, that's quite a lot about developed countries, the risky stuff. Now the good news. You can invest in emerging markets. When you invest in emerging markets, you should be investing not just because um, it's uh, some peripheral region. Right? People call it a region. You should go and look at a map. 
um, which you know might be 5% of your allocation. Real economic activity is 56% um, uh, purchasing on a purchasing power parity basis. 56% of the global economy is now in emerging markets, the bulk, and growing fast. And these countries have enormous productivity uh, ahead of them. Uh, we've got undervalued exchange rates, as I mentioned. Very, very attractive places to invest. And you shouldn't be investing. How should you invest? Well, uh, Andrew Smithers, in his, uh, one of his books, talks about there only really being two ways to value a, a stock or a financial asset. One is some re replacement value, say Tobin's Q, uh, or the one that we're really interested in, uh, uh, future income. That's actually what we want to hear about. So what's the best measure of future income? Past income. What's the best measure of past income? GDP. That's the 56% number. Um, so that's actually where people should be invested. But you, of course, you know, does that meet your liabilities? Let me tell you something about liabilities. Um, if I do have that period of high inflation for a decade, and I've got my pension of £2,000 a month, and that can buy me, if I'm lucky, a copy of BNE, uh, I'm going to be a bit annoyed. <laughs> What I actually want is future purchasing power of the, the collection of goods and services that I want to consume in my retirement. That's what I'm interested in. So say in 20 years, 90% of cars in the world are produced and consumed in emerging markets. Pick another, pick another uh, good or service for that matter. Commodity markets are already the case. Emerging markets are already, and they are becoming more and more, price setters in lots and lots of markets. What that means is that if my pension fund doesn't invest 56% in emerging markets today, ignoring all the risks I've talked about in the developed world, this is just a, a neutral position, then they're taking a gamble away from my real liabilities expressed in purchasing power. That is not what is factored in to uh, regulatory, regulatory structures for pension funds. Why? Because financial repression again. Pension funds are a really useful source of savings to funnel into the government. So we have uh, also a complete misperception of what risk is about. We have um, misunderstanding of liabilities. We have um, these huge risks in the, in the developed world. And we have, um, at the end of the day, a really strong psychological desire not to invest in emerging markets. In 2002, it was Brazil, which was the bogeyman. And um, Argentina had blown up in December 2001, completely predictable, by the way, and a very good example why passive investment isn't always a good idea. If I drive a car and I close my eyes when I'm driving, I can argue quite correctly that I'm saving energy. And uh, by the way, anybody that didn't see Argentina as a very serious default risk in 01 has no business managing money in emerging markets at all, because it was about as obvious as things ever get. So just avoiding some risks massively through active management massively, massively can reduce uh, real risk. So we have this, this post-01 uh, problem in Brazil. The, uh, uh, the electoral challenger, Lula, who um, uh, basically had, for eight years, his party, the Workers' Party, had said no uh, to pretty much every uh, reasonable reform uh, suggested by the incumbent government. And their prize, they were going to get the presidency. There was a lot of bitterness. And so there was a lot of bad mouthing of Lula done by the opposition in, in the then incumbents in New York. And the, the, they were told this guy has long hair and he's a complete you know, ideologue. And you couldn't be further from the truth. He made his, his reputation by being a conciliator, by being non-ideological. A little bit of political science would have told you all that. But anyway, that was the background. And then one of the big New York banks, because of uh, dot com, nothing to do with Brazil, uh, pulled some of their, uh, uh, they stopped rolling over debt in, in Brazil. And then you had... Um, the analysts started working out why there was going to be a problem in Brazil. So every two weeks or so, they'd come up with a different reason. Oh, well, the corporates in Brazil are not going to be able to repay the, the loans. They're not going to be able to roll the debt. And then they did. 
oh, well, then they have to go to the central bank for the dollars. Um, and the central bank will have a, 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 not a solvency, but a liquidity problem. Oh, but they were actually in an IMF program and therefore got the 30 billion. That was completely predictable. Um, so then they moved and it just moved and moved and moved until the hedge funds basically worked out that they, could, uh, uh, they couldn't uh, stay short uh, for more than the 12 months needed to actually collapse the country. And so the self-predicting, uh, 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 prediction, you know, self-fulfilling pr uh, prophecy failed in emerging markets and it never has worked really uh, since in a, in, a, in a convincing way. We have today a, a different bogeyman and it's China. So there are every few weeks somebody comes up with another reason why China's really a terrible reason to invest in emerging markets. And without spending the time going through the arguments, you know, you can knock down pretty much every single one of those arguments. Because China is actually the country which has done more structural reform than any other country on the planet in the last 10 years. And it's moving very, very constructively away from an export model of growth to a consumption model of growth. It's had difficulties along the way, but it does manage itself. And the big concerns about off-balance sheet debts and local authorities and banks, etc., is missing the point about what the problem is. In the West, we worry about such problems because they can cause a sudden stop in credit, in the credit markets. But if I take a bank in China and I just scrub out the name bank on the top and I put social expenditure department, you probably get a better idea of what it is. And uh, the problem is not one of a banking problem or a sudden stop. It's a question of can the central government afford to bail out uh, the banks? Yes. Does it have an effect on, does it have an effect on, their, uh, on the national accounts or the credit rating? Uh, no. It's a simple answer. Um, so we have a world where we need prejudices because they enable us to uh, avoid thinking about difficult problems. My book, my message, is not an easy one. I'm saying that to complement your very fine CFA education, you need to supplement that with trying to introduce macroeconomics in particular, but also politics and history and anthropology for that matter, right in the center of your strategic thinking of asset allocation, not as an afterthought. And strategic planning, by the way, is not something you do once a year. You know, when the, when the troops were, you know, piling in from Germany into Belgium in 1939, you don't sort of sit there saying, well, our strategic planning meeting isn't for another three months. You, you grab everything that isn't fixed and you run. Strategic thinking has to be done all the time. And to compensate for behavioral biases, you have to work out what they are and compensate for them, not just say that we've got them, therefore we can't make decisions. But these are the, some of the ideas which I hope to uh, raise in, in this speech, but also in the book. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed my little talk. I think we've got time for some questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? There's a question over there. Good evening. Very good. Uh, good evening, Gitti Novak, Charles University of Prague. Uh, you touched up on a large array of topics, so I would like to ask two questions. The first one, I got the uh, impression that you dislike the dead bodies that people are aware of but want to somehow suppress. Uh, so I Sorry. wonder, in case of Greece... Say that again. Uh, the dead bodies, you know, oh, yeah. the ones that are covered. Um, so in case of Greece, if you were a German chancellor, let's say, would you go there today and say, well, listen, we have this dead body here, we should do something about that, and let's just go for some orderly default. Is that what you would recommend to, to the people who are taking these negotiations? First question. Second question, what is your macro outlook for, for Russia? Uh, how, it's a big emerging market. Um, this part of the world is very, uh, very sort of tied to, that, the, to, to Russia. Where do you think things will develop in that part? Thank you. OK, two big questions. Uh, first, of course, I'm not the German Chancellor, so my answer is not going to be what the German Chancellor would do. Um, but I think, you know, first of all, there has to be a write-off of the debt. Secondly, we have a victory for legitimacy, uh, democratic legitimacy. 
uh, with the election. I, I think it's outrageous that uh, people in Europe, in, in the European Union, have got so used to being told what to do uh, without any real democratic say in the matter. Um, th I think it's amazing that the Greeks have put up with this for so long. Um, austerity is not working, it's as simple as that, and it was never going to work uh, on its own. There has been adjustment. So what would my advice be? Well, there are bad ways to do what's going to happen, and there are good ways, and I would promote um, very sound uh, fiscal management. And in particular, I would be uh, politically, domestically, if I was the Greece finance minister, I would be making a big issue about uh, tax collection, uh, which is consistent with their, uh, you know, their, 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 their election campaign, but, but um, partly. Collecting, collecting tax from the rich, but not the bit about, oh, well, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll bail you out to the tune of 70 billion because you were late with your payments uh, to everybody else. There has to be fiscal uh, discipline um, in order to maintain, at the very minimum, the fiscal surplus, the primary surplus. So for those that don't know, a primary surplus is, the, is a budget surplus excluding interest payments, key point, because you're not necessarily going to pay those. Um, if you then have... Um, a, a primary surplus, you are then in a position to have very strong bargaining power with the German Chancellor or whoever. Because you can say very credibly, we can actually devalue and with a little bit of um, uh, uh, help in the interim from someone, doesn't have to be you, could be the Russians, that's been mentioned, or the Chinese, um, we can then uh, actually uh, create uh, productive growth and jobs uh, very quickly in the economy when we have a, a massively, you know, a new currency which is much, much cheaper. We may not be there yet, but that, that, is, that is the obvious uh, bargaining position. And then if that is a credible bargaining position, I would imagine that then the result will be not that, but, um, oh, here's, we'll just, we, we'll just let you have the money. And of course, to save face, we have things like perpetual bonds, uh, a, a British invention. Um, whereby you never pay the principal back at all, which sounds a really good idea. So, um, you know, there, will be, there are other devices to save face, but I think that's the answer in, as briefly as I can, really. Uh, on Russia, um, since 98, I've never felt that um, there were systemic crises in, in emerging markets and just in emerging markets, which for the asset classes across emerging markets as a whole didn't represent buying opportunities. I think... Um, the situation in Russia has been presented in a very one-sided way. Um, I think there's a fundamental point to say that the West doesn't have foreign policy. It has what I would call domestic policy with foreign implications. In other words, for me, to be sustainable, foreign policy has to cater to national interests. Anything of any scale that doesn't cater to national interests is not sustainable and therefore not credible. So when it comes to minor issues, you can have whatever foreign policy you want. But when it comes to a major issue, which is actually going to hurt your domestic economy, it's going to hurt your jobs, it's going to have a big impact on your citizens, your voters, you actually have to have it in line with national interests. And national interests tend to have a dynamic which is rather longer often than the political cycle. So I think there's a real question, do we have foreign policy? I don't think my own country really has a foreign policy. We have focus groups and followership, not leadership and all sorts of other problems. And I think Europe as a whole has really got itself in a complete mess um, because I think Russia to a certain extent has been highly predictable and uh, uh, that in no way endorses what's been going on. Uh, but I think we have just floundered about and I'm, I'm really disappointed in our reaction. Also, um, we have to recognize certainly for Germany, the national interests are real and they are very much against the use of sanctions rather than the other way around. And there's a clear tension trans transatlantic between very, very different objectives here. So um, I don't know what Britain's national interests are in Ukraine. I can't really think of any at all, to be honest. I, I find it very difficult to uh, justify you know, uh, 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 shooting ourselves in the foot. Another, there are lots of other aspects to this which I think are quite interesting. Sanctions are not isolating Russia. I mean, that's another key point. I did my doctoral thesis on agricultural protectionism, and um, 
uh, one of the conclusions was that the European uh, uh, agricultural policy uh, really is the most distortionary uh, set of trade policies on the planet. And when the US Department of Agriculture says that they are doing no more than countering the distortion caused by Europe, they're actually right. Um, and this has, for example, created export pessimism across many emerging markets of a scale which is 10 times the damage of, of the benefit of, of the entire uh, global aid budget. And uh, so in the case of Latin America, for example, for decades they have not been able to export to Russia because of massive dumping of agricultural product, products by the European Union. And now, because of sanctions, that's all come off. And I thought it, was, it would be amusing if it wasn't so serious how Brussels then asks the Latin American governments, please, you know, we've been kicking you in the head with our uh, boots for decades. Unfortunately, our boots come loose. Would you mind kicking yourself in the head for a bit and not exporting to Russia? You know, we have got to work out we live in a world which is very different to the one dominated by the US and Europe. We have to live in real politic and we have to be practical. And without wanting to sort of get too many people too emotional about this subject, this is what's lacking. This is why you should all read this, because this is more balanced about this particular issue. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Hello, I'm Dan Gladish. Um, I, I live in an emerging country. Yes. Uh, I work in an emerging country, and I should not have any prejudices against an emerging country, right? And yeah. I have uh, almost 25 years. <laughs> this is going to be negative, I'm warning you. <laughs> Um, I have almost 25 years experience of investing actively in emerging countries, emerging yeah. markets all over the world in all of the continents, many countries. And most of that experience is very negative. I can tell you why. You said that China has a great future. It, it might have, I don't know. But even if it does, when you start buying Chinese stocks, you will be robbed in most of the cases. That's the reality. And uh, this risk by far outweighs the macro potential positive. And the older I am, <laughs> the more I dislike the emerging markets. And I think my advice for everybody is to stay away from them. <laughs> because you would not put the pension fund of your parents or yourselves in the hands of people in emerging markets. This is extremely risky. And I, I don't want to make uh, controversial, but if I ask you to name five Chinese companies with world-class corporate governance, I think we'll have a real problem here. No, I would say, contrary to that, I'd say don't invest in the riskiest place first. So A, don't invest in the stock market before the bond market. Okay, if you want to do, you can invest in China, in the bond market. Um, much less risky. You don't have, the whole point is, when Antoine van Eckmel created the term emerging markets, uh, way back in the 80s, when he was at the IFC. The whole point about emerging markets, it was an equity concept that he invented. And it was based on the idea that you had this new index of countries which were investable. And below that were those countries where they just hadn't reached the, 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 the transparency, the corporate governance. In equities, that's still very much an issue. Emerging debt all goes all the way down because it's covered by US or, or London law. Very different set of risks. So the answer is, don't invest in uh, investing in Chinese corporates. You, you know, you've hit the nail on the head. I don't invest in Chinese corporates, it's simple, and I never have. Um, and that's one of the reasons is because, um, whereas I've, we've done plenty of deals with the Chinese government, the central government, and we've never had any problems at all with the central government, the moment you get below that, you have all sorts of problems. But I would invest, and I do invest, in companies in India. I am invested in that. That's where I've got my biggest investment. Investments. Um, and I think we can be anecdotal about all sorts of things. I could stand up and give you an emotional speech about how you should never invest in Enron or General Motors. You know, there's crooks everywhere in the world. There are problems everywhere in the world. Um, the range of opportunities in emerging markets, though, is absolutely enormous and much underappreciated. And you don't have to do the riskiest things first. You do the sovereign debt. Sovereign debt of most emerging markets is miles safer, safe, safer than the sovereign debt of, of most countries in, in southern Europe. Miles safe. And you get paid for it as well. Um, 
I would say that one of the riskiest asset classes on the planet is sub-investment grade corporate debt in the United States. Complete bubble. Absolutely disastrous. And all that money that's being raised is merely going to pay off existing loans. Very different from corporate debt, even in Russia. And in 08, when the uh, uh, market makers deserted emerging markets and the corporate debt yields got up, uh, went started going up, when they got to about 15%, we had a whole new range of investor base coming in, buying the assets. They were local investors. So what you have from emerging markets is diversity. You have a different perception of risk. You don't have this uh, herd-like mentality you get in the West. So there is a place, even, and this is the whole point, I invest in emerging markets to reduce risk. And, and that doesn't mean I pick five companies uh, equity in China. I don't do that. I wouldn't do that. So I would agree with you on that. So, so you have to, you know, you have to, uh, there's a place for it. But, but I'm not also saying that emerging markets aren't risky. I'm saying that everything's risky. That's what I'm really saying. Everything is risky. And the moment you think that something isn't risky, you're making a mistake. Any other questions? I haven't stunned everybody, surely. Okay. So, should we buy gold? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, well, you can if you want to speculate, but... but um, you know, gold is a is 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 not a gold standard is not coming back for a number of reasons. It didn't come back in '44 because um, uh, you'd have to increase the price of gold astronomically, and that would make uh, the Russians uh, and the South Africans very wealthy. It's not going to happen today. Um, and the tensions that we had when, under the fixed exchange rate regime are, were, were, are sufficient, uh, let alone the impracticality of going back to the gold standard to make gold the gold standard reality. Short of that. It's very difficult to see how gold is anything more or less than a speculative investment because its use value bears no relation to the, to the price. And we know that a large portion of the gold uh, is held by a fairly homogenous investor base, namely, apart from a lot of retail in India, central banks. And central banks do and have sold en masse gold before, and there's a very risk, real risk they would do it again. And they have an informational advantage over the market, which is massive and convincing. So for me, gold is a purely speculative investment and uh, personally being a prudent inv individual, I don't have any. Thank you. I think that's probably it. Is that right? Okay, thank you very much.